be reading from Psalms 112, verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who hear, who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, again, Father, we come to you thanking you so much for the wonderful day. And Father, thankful for each and every one that's here this morning who desire to be here, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we ask that you be with our service today, that everything we say and do will be pleasing to you, will bring praise and honor to your name. And Father, we're mindful of all the fathers today that uh, as today being Father's Day that we celebrate, we pray for each and every one of them and their children. And, uh, and it's a privilege to be able to call you Father. God, just please be with us uh, during our service. We pray that everything we say and do will be pleasing to you. And... Thank you so much for all that you do, but most of all for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The opening hymn is I Am Lying, O Lord, verses 1, 2, and 4. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. 
you're visiting with us this morning and wish to partake of communion, you're welcome to. Uh, there were packets at the door. If you did not receive one, it will be handed to you now. And uh, if you raise your hand, it will be brought to your seat. We need one here, Rivetta. We need a packet here for, for uh, <laughs> any others? We'll be doing our communion song, and uh, it's going to be the old rugged cross, and we'll do verses uh, one and four of that. And then after that, Jason will lead us in our communion service. <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a word of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some If someone, come up, if someone came up to you and asked, what is your favorite meal, would you be able to quickly rattle it off? If you could quickly answer that question, would it remind you of the last time that you had partaken of that meal? Does your favorite meal ever bring back fond memories? These are many questions I do not expect you to raise your hand and share with the congregation this morning, but I do want you to think about that meal. Today is Father's Day, and some of us will leave the church and celebrate some kind of meal with your father. Typically, you will try to eat something that he likes. You may go to his favorite restaurant or someone in your family may prepare his favorite dish and you eat it at the home. For some of us, you think, may think back to the last Father's Day you had with your dad. He may not be with you in person anymore, but you, may, but you will still think back and I hope you find priceless memories and unforgettable memories. Right now, we are able to partake of another meal. As we take the Lord's Supper today, and as we look at the emblems representing Jesus' body and his blood, let's try to think about what it was like for God the Father 
to look at his son and see how he was treated so unfairly on the cross at Calvary. How anguished the father's heart must have been to hear his own son cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. And yet during those hours on the cross, Jesus was doing his father's bidding, his father's will. Jesus could have easily said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the tasks that you have given me. Even though we see God saying, this is my son in whom I, I love and with whom I am well pleased after his baptism, it could have also been possible that the same words could have been found on the, at the time of the crucifixion. Jesus' enemies thought that his death was the sign that God had forsaken him, Matthew 27, 43. But they were wrong. This was the Father's greatest moment. Hebrews 2.10 tells us that one of the results of the Son's death was to bring many sons and daughters to glory. On this, on this Lord's day, the Father looks down upon assemblies such as our own and rejoices in his fellowship with his members of his family across the earth. This, too, is a Father's proud moment. Proverbs 10.1 tells us a wise son brings joy to his father. As we take these emblems, let us resolve to live that we bring joy in many proud moments to our Heavenly Father. The Lord's Supper is simple, and yet it's pr pr deeply profound. It is personal, as if I'm the only one participating, and yet it is universal. Precious to every Christian who partakes. It looks back across the ravages of time, and yet it looks forward to a time when time will be no more. It is a picture of a tragic death, and yet it is a proclamation of a triumphant life. It is not expensive to provide, and yet it was so very costly to purchase. The food is that of a poor man, just a bite of bread and a sip of juice, and yet never has such an extravagant meal ever been served. We who are many become as one body when we partake of it together. When our sin is forgiven, the Lord assures us that he will always forget it. But we must always remember how such forgiveness is possible. No wonder Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, Luke 22, 19. We who are imperfect take the Lord's Supper to, be, to remember the perfect lamb without spot or blemish. We who are the sinners take the Lord's Supper to, remind, to remember a sinless substitute who became our Savior. We who are perishable take the Lord's Supper to remember an imperishable promise from an eternal God. We who are lost take the Lord's Supper to remember the one who found us. We who are in the land of the dying take the Lord's Supper to remember the one and only who can usher us into the land of living. We are invited to this meal weekly by the one who loves us more than life itself. So we can go ahead and open up your communion packet. I'll say a brief prayer. We can shake up the bread and then we'll do the same for the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you again for another opportunity that you've blessed us to be able to gather back out at your house this morning with brothers and sisters of like faith and that we can gather around this communion table. Lord, as we look down upon these emblems, we do remember what this bread represents. It represents your son's body that was beaten and punished and just everything that he had to go through to endure uh, a, a wrongful uh, conviction. But Lord, he done it for us. He took upon our sins so that we had the opportunity to be able to spend eternity with you. Lord, I pray that we remember this bread and what it represents. Thank you, God, for all the many blessings your son has given to us and that you've given to us. And we can partake of the bread now. And Heavenly Father, as we look down upon this, um, this juice, I do we pray that we remember what it represents as well. It represents just a small portion of the blood that was shed for our sins. Without the shedding of blood, Lord, we all, we all know here that forgiveness is not possible. We'll remind of the beating that Jesus took, the punishment, the, every time the whip hit him, flesh was torn from his body and blood was, was poured out everywhere. He carried his own cross through the streets, and just the humiliation of that itself is unbearing for many people. Lord, he, he done it all for us. This sip of juice 
It reminds me of probably the large um, drops of blood that fell from his body and from his brow. Lord, I pray that we just never take this moment for granted. We've seen how easily this can be taken away from us. And Lord, thank you for all that your son does for us. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray that we can go through about the remainder of this week and we can take Bob's message and we can be able to apply it to our lives and that we can just be a proud, have proud moments with you. Thank you, God, for all that you do. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And you can check the cup. Thank you for your attention. And Paige, and Mike, and Jason uh, for leading us in our worship so far this morning. The scripture text is uh, 1 Peter 1, starting with verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from, a pure, from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Now, this list is not exhaustive, of course, but I want us to look at six qualities of our Heavenly Father. You fathers that are Christians also have these qualities. And these are qualities that you should strive for every day as well as all of us should. But these are qualities that God already possesses. And that's why we can put our faith and confidence in him. Number one, God is a provider. Every morning that we get up, every breath we take, every step, every morsel of food, every kindness and love that we feel from our families, everything is from our provider, God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And you and I are blessed with God's good gifts every moment of every day. From the time we get up, to the time we lie down at night, and all through the night, he is our provider. But he is also our protector. Those of us that had good fathers and were blessed by fathers who had these qualities know that we've had fathers that worked hard to provide for us and to give us not only the things that we need, but the things that we want as well. And so God does that. God is a protector. Your earthly fathers protected you from danger. The rules of their household many times was simply to protect you, not to confine you, not to keep you from having fun, but to protect us and keep us alive and well. Let's see what God says about this in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. 
He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. We know that the evil one is Satan. We know that Satan has followers. We know that he even has what we would refer to as angels, that he would call angels, but they're actually demons. And their job is to constantly keep us from doing God's will. And God, with the Holy Spirit and his guardian angels that we read about in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 in the last verse, they're there to protect us. You know, even little children can get away from their parents who are trying to protect them. I don't know how many times it's happened to me, even though I'm not a father. I've had nieces and nephews that I was close to, and uh, I'd be with them in the mall or in a parking lot somewhere, crossing a road, uh, going somewhere. And, of course, our natural inclination is when they're very young is to grab them by the hand and take them where they need to go. And they resist. They do not like that. They say they're big. And they don't need anybody to hold their hand. And so as we grow and get older in life, we think that we're big uh, spiritually and that we don't need a protector anymore, but we do. We continually need God every day to protect us from the evil one. God is also a promise keeper. He's given a lot of promises in the Bible. And if we will obey his will, those promises will be fulfilled. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You see, we can participate in a lot of things in this life, physically, things that are enjoyable, things that we do every day with our families or at school, with friends and co-workers. We can participate in all of these things, but none of those can help us participate in the divine nature except God himself. Now, you and I are here this morning because we want to fulfill the divine nature in us. You may say, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't have any divine nature. Yes, you do. You're made in the image of God. We have a human nature, but we also have a divine nature. Now, most of us are giving in to our human nature way more often than we ought to. Uh, we have these cravings in our lives that God gave us, and it's good to fulfill them. But sometimes we are negligent in fulfilling the craving of our divine nature. There's something about a human that makes them reach out to the eternal God. And this verse tells us that when we obey these precious promises, we can participate in the divine nature. We also see that God is a peacemaker. Now, he brings peace into our lives when we're having personal problems. He can bring peace in families. He can bring peace in nations. He can be, bring peace in churches. And we need, need in according to the scriptures, to make that effort to keep the bond of peace. It takes two for a peace treaty. You know that. It, you can't, one person can't do it. It takes two parties to make a peace treaty. And God has said that he's willing to make peace with us. But we also need to be willing to make uh, peace with him. In the book of Philippians, there's a beautiful section of scripture regarding peace. And I want you to notice these words from chapter 4 
and starting with verse number seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need to be guarded. That's part of the protection plan. And peace provides us. Let's read on. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. Now here is things we can do to accomplish this concept of peace. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Humans are marvelous creatures in that we can control our thoughts. Now others try to control our thoughts, it's true. Advertisers are always trying to control our thoughts. Uh, when my niece Megan was, uh, Stephanie rather, was very young at the table, she would give thanks for the food. I always love to hear her give thanks. She would thank God for every item on the plate. And uh, she thanked God one day for the rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. And that's because the advertisers were promoting it. Rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. It's amazing how advertising can control us. Uh, there have been times, I can remember I'd be at the house watching TV, and something would come on about food. And I really like food. And, uh, and didn't have any at the house. I went in the kitchen to get some. Well, the advertising was so good, I got in my car and went down the road and got what I wanted. Advertising is powerful. You know, uh, during these main events on TV, these advertisers spend millions and millions and millions of dollars just on one minute of commercial because they know that it works. But it's not only advertisers that are influencing us. There's people that are trying to influence our moral values. There's people trying to influence our faith and our beliefs. But the good thing about it is, even though all these influences are around us, we have the final say. We can decide what we think. And that's what it says here. Think about what's right and pure and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put in to practice. We wonder, well, how are we ever going to get any peace? Well, practice the things that God wants us to do, and we read, the God of peace will be with you. Finally, uh, God is a planner. He's got plans for our lives. Now you may say, well, does that mean that I can't do what I want to do and become what I want to become and be what I want to be? Work where I want to work, go to school where I want to go to school? Yeah, you can do all of that because God works through you. He doesn't make you do anything you don't want to do. That's one thing we've noticed about God. Everybody kind of does what they want to anyhow, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. But God has some ideal plans for our lives. He placed in us gifts that nobody else has. And when you find that gift and cultivate that gift and study to fulfill that gift, maybe for your uh, occupation, for your profession, well, God is going to bless us. He has plans for us, and the plans are good. Uh, the plans are not for our bodies to be harmed, for it to be disunity or uh, lack of peace among us. 
or confusion. His plans are extremely for our good. He wants what we want. Those ideas that you and I have about uh, what we would like to do in life, where we'd like to live, where we'd like to work, those things are placed in us as well. He works with us, not against us. You know, uh, a counselor, I, I know we have a, a school counselor here with us this morning, and I don't know exactly how she does things, but, uh, you know, she may take um, a person's IQ figure and find out what uh, areas that they are superior at and point it out to each student and may even recommend, well, you, you know, you're great at math or uh, you're great with words and, and you can choose this particular profession to go into. Now, they do not overwhelm the student. They just give them options of what they can do. God gives us options as well. Sometimes we make choices that are bad, just plain bad, because they're dangerous and harmful to us. Some choices are good, and other choices are better, and some choices are the best. And this is what we deal with in life constantly, and our planner, God, wants us to help us make the best choices. And I haven't always made the best choices, but one good thing about God and the way he plans things is if you take the wrong road, go down the wrong trail, it's okay. And he can bring you back and put you where you ought to be to be happy and fulfilled. We don't always understand the Lord's will correctly. You know, we may be like that preacher who got a call to go to a big church with a lot, a good salary, and, and you know, a lot of members, and, and uh, prestigious, and uh, this is how he prayed. Um, he went home, he said to his wife, you pack, we're going to another church, and I'll go upstairs and pray about it. You see, he already made up his mind. A lot of times we make up our minds first, and then it works out maybe not so good for us. Does that mean that God is going to say, well, you made your own bed, you go ahead and sleep in it, and I'm not going to help you out? He doesn't do that. We make mistakes. We interpreted his will wrong, but he's always one there to bring us back. You know, even... Uh, my OnStar on the car can help you get back on the road. I don't know how many times I've heard, you've taken the wrong turn, make the next left turn when it's safe. And I don't know how many times that's happened in my life. You know, I, God doesn't vocally speak to me, but when I read in his word, well, man, I took a wrong turn there. And, uh, and he's going to bring me back. And this is what Isaiah said in chapter 64, verses 8 and 9. You, Lord, are our Father. Now, you see, each of us had fathers who tried to guide us and help us. And, uh, you know, we were constantly making mistakes when we were kids, flubbing up all along the way. But they were always there to love us and try to redirect us. So this is what Isaiah is saying, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure. Lord, do not remember our sins forever. And of course he doesn't. He made a way, he made a plan for us to overcome our sins. And that plan is simple, that we believe in Jesus and repent of our sins. We confess the Lord as our Savior and be baptized. Now, even though it sounds simple, it was very difficult to do. That plan was very difficult to carry out. It was brought out in our communion devotion today. The elements 
that we partake in the Lord's Supper are simple and inexpensive. But as Jason pointed out, the price that was paid that those elements represent was not cheap. The Lord going to the cross. I read a, uh, came across a short article uh, by Bob Russell, and uh, it ties in with so much what Jason said uh, this morning. Uh, Bob, of course, is, is a retired minister of the, one of the largest churches in the country, and uh, he said he was on an airplane, and he was uh, that week preparing a lesson on Matthew chapter 27, which Jason referred to this morning, which deals with the way Jesus was treated uh, just before his crucifixion and the crucifixion itself. And uh, he said, when I got on the plane, I took the window seat, and then uh, there was a seat between us, and then a businessman sat down in the third seat with the seat between them. And uh, Bob said he was reading the sports page and enjoying it, and uh, he said the man next to him evidently was a businessman wearing a suit, and uh, he said he pulled out a tablet and started writing, uh, furiously writing and writing and writing. And uh, finally, after a period of time, he looked over at Bob Russell and he said, are you Bob Russell, the minister? And he said, yes. He said, I don't mean to bother you because I know you're very busy. He said, but I was wondering if you would read this and help me with this because this is really disturbing me. And he shared his thoughts. And of course, Bob said, I put the paper down for the next hour. We talked and I prayed with him. He said, and he said, I read what he wrote down. And he was a businessman who was very successful and had a very fine home a good family, a good wife, three healthy children, but he had one child who was 16 years old who is causing havoc in the home. He was into drugs, he was very rebellious, he was just, everything was so negative, and uh, he was so upset, there was nothing he could do to make it better. He tried tough love, uh, he tried uh, special, uh, uh, taking him to specialists, who could counsel him, and it did no good. And uh, he said, we need something higher than ourselves to help us out. And Bob said that that which he had written about the sacrifices that he was trying to make uh, for his child reminded him of what he read in Matthew 27 uh, about Jesus and about how uh, God had to watch while his son uh, went to the cross, while he suffered that agony and, and pain. You know that God could have intervened any moment. Jesus said he call, could have called a legion of angels. 10,000 angels could have come uh, to, to release him and set him free. But God didn't use any of the miraculous means to release him. He let him go through all of this. And any father on earth would probably not allow their child to do that if he had any power at all to stop it. But God didn't stop it because he had this plan. And Jesus was part of that plan. Sin has to be punished. We are all sinners. We all deserve hell. So how do you punish sin without sending somebody to hell? Well, you cause somebody to go through the punishment for them. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He went through the punishment for you and me. And that's why we need to love him, honor him, and also obey him. I want to close with Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God said, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You have a future with Christ. I know we have some type of future. 
hopefully, the next minute, maybe hour, day, months, maybe even years. But who's that future with? Uh, I hope it's with Christ. If you're here this morning and not yet uh, obedient to the gospel, I invite you to step forward and we'll uh, help you accomplish that. 